the Vanderbeekers of 141st Street. We're going to read chapter 17, but let's think about chapter 16. Um, let's see, remember that Isa was recording her violin and um, Jesse was making that um, lemon uh, light thing. And uh, Oliver did a uh, haiku. They're trying to give him presents to change his mind. And then um, they found out, remember Oliver's friend found out that Abigail Biederman and uh, the daughter Luciana died on the same day. And now they're trying to figure out why. And let's see. And then remember, um, Isa went to Castleman's and uh, Benny, she and Benny kind of had a words argument a little bit. Um, and they're both talking about different things and how, um, Benny finally said, uh, uh, Isa said, I'm not going to the dance, and no one asked me, and Benny said, I asked you. And then she said, what? And remember then, Je she, um, Benny said that Jessie had said that she wouldn't want to go to a dance. Um, and then she said, at the end, she said to herself, I need to talk to Jessie. Okay, 17. Mama was exasperated. Mr. Biederman's real estate agent had the nerve to call about someone seeing the place tomorrow. Tomorrow! Christmas Eve! Mama said absolutely, definitely no apartment showings on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. When the agent continued to wheedle her, Mama hung up on her. The nerve! I have too much to do, Mama said, taking, uh, talking to herself as she stood in the middle of the living room full of boxes. Oliver was sitting inside one box reading, and Lainey was sitting in another, pretending she was a puppy. I can help you, Hyacinth offered from her spot on the rug. Her brow was furrowed as she manipulated knitting needles, and Frances' eyes were glued to the unwinding yarn ball. Mama glanced at the grimy basset hound. You know you can help. France needs a bath. It had been three weeks since France's last bath. The longer France went without a bath, the wilder and more erratic his behavior became. He was much more contained when he had clean ears and smelled like honeysuckle. With the swiftness of hunted gazelles, Oliver and Laney jumped out of their boxes and raced up the stairs. Their disappearances were phenomenons that happened every time Hyacinth gave France a bath. Hyacinth eyed her dog. Don't worry, France. This will be quick. France hunkered, da hunkered down by the back door and tried to make himself invisible. Hyacinth lured him with her secret weapon, a dog biscuit, and Francis' stomach betrayed him as he crept toward the heavenly smelling treat. Hyacinth grabbed his collar at the same time France grabbed the biscuit and she used all her strength to drag him toward the bathroom and into the tub. 15 minutes later, France was hoarse from his persistent howling and they were both soaked. Hyacinth wrapped France in a fluffy towel, then braced herself and knocked on the bathroom door three times. Are you ready? Hyacinth yelled. Not yet. Wait. Okay. I think everything is secure, her mother yelled back. Hyacinth opened the door a crack and peeked out. Her mom had put up an old baby gate to block the stairs leading up to the bedrooms, and Paganini had been removed to safely upstairs. Mama was standing on the other side of the baby Kate gate, ready for France's appearance. Woof, 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 woof! France broadcast as he nudged his way out of the bathroom and bounded through the living room and kitchen. He bounced off sofas and knocked over chairs and skidded into moving boxes. These post-bath rampages lasted only about 10 minutes and the Vanderbeekers knew to steer clear until France exhausted himself. Unfortunately, when Hyacinth let France loose, she did not count on someone coming home at that exact moment. The front door opened and in walked Isa. 
Watch out! Hyacinth yelled at Isa. France! Mama yelled at the crazed dog, but it was too late. Mama shielded her eyes. Woof! Barked France, running straight toward Isa and not stopping until he rammed right into her and knocked her down, leaving a basset hound sized wet spot on her jacket. What the? Isa felt something inside her snap. She pushed France off and struggled to her feet. France, who now realized that knocking Isa over was one of his poorer decisions of the year, retreated slowly to Hyacinth, who stood in the bathroom doorway, still dripping. The commotion in the living room was so dramatic that, that the Vanderbeeker kids peeked down and watched as Isa marched to the head of the basement stairs, where Jesse had just appeared after waking up from her nap. You! Isa pointed a finger at Jesse. We need to talk right now! Isa strode out the back entrance into the yard, the door slamming behind her. Jesse was petrified. Isa had never, ever raised her voice to her like that. She felt the eyes of her family follow her as she walked through the kitchen and into the backyard. Isa stood stiffly under the old maple, her back to Jesse. Wind gusted around them and Jesse rubbed her arms, shivering. I was just at Castleman's, Isa said. Jesse gulped. Guess who I saw there? Uh, Mrs. Castleman? Jesse suggested, hopefully. Benny! Isa shouted, turning to face Jesse, the wind whipping through her hair. He hates me, all because of you! I can explain, Isa. Do you have the right to make decisions for me? You knew I wanted to go to the dance. Now Benny thinks I hate him. Why would you do this to me? I saw I thought you wouldn't want to go. Remember how I used to make fun of those dances? I am not you, Isa yelled. We are not the same person, and because of you, Benny asked someone else to the dance. Tears ran down Isa's face. Jesse was a statue, unable to move or say a word. Isa's voice lowered. I want you to leave me alone. Don't speak to me. Don't speak to me. Don't make decisions for me. Don't talk to other people about me. Got it? Isa flew back into the apartment and the door banged closed. Her family, who had watched the entire exchange through the windows, jumped guiltily away. Their eyes followed Isa as she stormed upstairs. When they heard her bedroom door slam, they returned to the windows to look for Jessie. Her back was to them, but they could see her shoulders hunch. Jessie stood out there for five minutes in the cold with no jacket before Mama joined her. Hey, Mama said, draping a coat over her. Jessie was shaking. Wanna talk? Can I help? Jessie shook her head. Mama put her arms around Jessie's waist, pulling her close, murmuring comforting words. Together they stood until Jessie began to shake so un uncontrollably that Mama took her arm and guided her inside. Later that evening, Jessie went to bed on the couch. I said made it clear she did not want to see Jessie that night or possibly ever again. It was the first time in their lives that the, that the twins had slept, hadn't slept in the same room. Sensing that she needed com companionship, George Washington curled at Jessie's side and did not once attack her feet. Paganini lay on the floor at the foot of the couch, nose twitching and ears pricked forward as if on alert for danger. Tears leaked from Jessie's eyes and soaked into her pillow as she stared at the ceiling, counting the number of times she heard ambulance sirens blare down the avenue en route to the hospital. She counted eight before she settled into a troubled sleep. A few hours later, she awoke to see her father dozing on the floor next to Paganini. Papa, Jessie whispered, her voice rough with sleep and tears. Moral support, he said, in case you need me. Jessie closed her eyes again as more tears rolled down her cheeks. Upstairs, Isa had not had yet to fall asleep. Her mind buzzed with thoughts of her sister and Benny and eighth grade dances and long pale pink dresses and corsages. The thoughts merged into the Biederman and their brownstone and her basement and Isa felt so lonely and lost that she didn't know how their mission to win him over could possibly succeed. After another hour of tossing, Isa remembered the envelope Mrs. Castleman had given her. She got out of bed and dug through her bag to find it. As she opened the envelope, a yellowed newspaper clipping fluttered to the ground. Isa quickly scanned the article and felt her heart stretch tight. She slipped the newspaper clipping back into the envelope and stuck it between two books on her bookshelf. 
Then she left her room and crept down the hall to her parents' room. Mama was sleeping alone in the bed. Isa got under the covers and curled in next to her. Mama opened her eyes. Hi, sweetie, she murmured. Mama, Isa said, rubbing her chest where her heart lay underneath. Everything hurts. I know, sweetie, Mama said, stroking her hair. I know. When Isa finally drifted off an hour later, the brownstone groaned with relief as the last Vanderbeeker fell into a fitful sleep. And then there's a picture of the article. I'll read it to you. Local mother and daughter killed in Harlem motorist accident. Abigail Biederman, 42, and her daughter Luciana Biederman, 16, were crossing the street at 137th Street and Covenant Avenue when they were struck by a cab, said police. They were five blocks from their Harlem home. The driver, David Albertson, sustained minor injuries. A cab came speeding around the corner, said Helen Castleman, a local baker who witnessed the accident in front of her business. It was a horrible scene. The victims were rushed to Harlem Hospital where Abigail Biederman was pronounced dead. Luciana Biederman died from injuries later that evening. The driver was released from the hospital and police are investigating whether he was driving while intoxicated. No arrests have been made. Dawn, dawn, dawn. Oh my gosh.